What you're telling me is that music is about to stop, and we're going to be left holding the biggest bag of odorous excrement ever assembled in the history of Gap. 1974, 1987, 92, 97, 2000, and whatever we want to call this. It's all just the same thing over and over. We can't help ourselves. I say when we sell. Hey, 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 I say when we sell. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Last Trade. This week we have Richard Byworth, and I'm joined by my co-host Michael Tanguma, and we have Brian Cabellis this week standing in for Jesse. So, Richard, how are you doing? Great to see you. Yeah, very good. Thanks, Jackson. Great to be here with you guys. Appreciate it. So, Richard, really excited for this one. Um, I know at Seize Capital you guys are doing a lot in the alternative space, uh, primarily focused on alternative investments and I know you would categorize yourself as a Bitcoiner, so really excited to hear uh, more about your traditional finance background and then talk a lot more about your journey into Bitcoin, how you think about it as an allocator, um, among many other things, getting a pulse on Switzerland and the European market. So maybe the best place to start, Richard, would just be to get a better sense of your background in traditional finance. Um, I know you've worked in many different capacities for um, maybe two decades or so, plus or minus. So would love to just hear more about your path and ultimately what led you here today. Sure. Well, look, thanks. And always, uh, always good to connect with fellow Bitcoiners. And uh, so, yeah, looking forward to this chat. So, look, to give you a quick uh, understanding of where I came from, I was an investment banker for pretty much um, the first, I think, 18 years of my career. Um, I worked in London as a trader. I was trading convertible bonds, uh, predominantly for Japanese underlyings. Um, so you think about MicroStrategy and what they've been using for their capital structuring. Uh, they're generally using convertible bonds. That's the most efficient product. That's what I was trading from 2000, basically, through to 2005, six. I moved to Tokyo at the beginning of 2005. So I was working for Nomura, the Japanese investment bank. Uh, moved to Tokyo at the beginning of 2005. Um, did five years there. Um, tail end of that was obviously Lehman. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but Lehman Brothers uh, got bought by two banks, uh, essentially. So you, Barclays bought the US operations and Nomura bought the European and Asian operations. So we ended up merging the most cowboy bank on Wall Street with the most aggressive bank in Japan. And you can imagine the cultural shocks uh, were, were fairly violent. Um, so it, it was fun. And I definitely think I could probably write a book about that, that whole experience. Um, but then, you know, interest rates went to zero. Uh, I think everyone in banking started to realize that we were going to have a major problem with, you know, inflation at some point. And so I, I bought gold in 2012 after dismissing Bitcoin from the junior kid on my desk who was talking about it in 2009 in Tokyo. Um, so I was like, can you just stop talking about scams <laughs> on the Internet and sell derivatives to your clients, please? Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, we... Um, I started buying gold in 2012 just as a hedge, just as a way to just protect against what was, for me at that point, an inevitability of the failure of, of, of fiat currencies. Um, and then in 2017, I, I was getting to the point where I wanted to leave banking for good. I was completely done with it mentally. And um, I was reading this book called Sapiens uh, by Yuval Harari. And... I agreed with a lot of what he was talking about with the future and models for society and humanity, etc. But he kept bringing up this Bitcoin thing, which I remembered as a scam from my kid on the desk in 2009. And I was like, why is he talking about this? Like, so I figured I'd probably better find out what it was and started reading about it middle of sort of 2017, which you'll remember was was a fairly uh, frothy period. So I was like, OK, I'm just going to buy some of this thing. So I, I turned to my grad on the desk at the time and uh, just being completely tech non savvy. And I was like, Herman, can you just 
you could just buy everyone on the desk a Bitcoin. It was trading at thousand dollars at the time. And um, I then went away for summer and I took a bit of a sabbatical. And I came back and Bitcoin had tripled. I was like, Herman, did you buy everyone that Bitcoin? He's like, oh, I thought you were joking. I was like, oh, sh screw this. I was like, okay, fine. I need to do this myself. I need to work it out. So at that point, I started working out, made the usual error that a lot of people made. I was like, oh, well, this Litecoin thing is really cheap. I could buy like 20 of these. Um, so I bought some Litecoin. It went up 5x in the period of five weeks. And I was like, okay, what the hell is going on here? So then I started investing in the space. I invested in a mining company, uh, which coincided with me leaving the bank. I was going to join a private equity company. And the mining company founder that I'd invested in said, hey, if you've left the bank, would you come and help me build this business? And I was like, how am I going to build a mining business? I'm a finance guy. Like, he was like, no, no, no. He's like, people are running around. I was in Hong Kong at the time. People are running around Hong Kong with suitcases full of cash. They've got no idea what regulation means in this space. If we build a regulated player, you know, we could be very differentiated and attract what will eventually be institutional flow. I was like, okay, that's a good story. So we, we started building this firm. It was called Diginex. Um, the firm expanded very rapidly um, and we ended up listing the company on NASDAQ through a SPAC uh, in 2020 at which point flows were getting difficult and we were competing with FTX and Binance who could onboard people in three minutes. We'd take three weeks to onboard people. So it was, uh, it was a very painful experience. So we were struggling a bit and so we were looking for an acquirer and then my chairman found Binance as the acquirer and I was like, I'm not getting in bed with those guys. So I stepped down and uh, I was sitting on the beach uh, in 2022, when Mark sees uh, the son of the family, uh, sees capital, obviously the namesake, uh, called me and said, would you come and run my hedge fund business? And I was like, well, yeah, but I'd want to keep my hand in with crypto. I think there's some very interesting alpha in, in hedge funds uh, using crypto as the arbitrage mechanism. And uh, yeah, that then progressed to where, where we are today, where um, obviously very involved in the Bitcoin space here in Switzerland. I, it, I got involved with uh, Relay. I don't know if you know those guys, the dollar cost averaging uh, platform here in Switzerland, which is probably the biggest in Europe. And in fact, maybe given the Swan situation is probably the biggest in the world now. Um, but yeah, fantastic guys. So I sit on the board of that company. Um, very close to them. And so, yeah, that's my sort of Bitcoin focus. That's, a that's an incredible, awesome story. Yeah. It's an that's... incredible story. You went from the cowboy, from one set of cowboys to the, the another set of cowboys in the wild west. <laughs> uh, exactly. To be in from from yeah. 18 to 23, you've definitely seen some, it's some crazy It's stuff. also interesting to me that you, you sort of stepped into the mining space initially because, mm. at least for me, when I was... So I started sort of understanding Bitcoin roughly the same time frame, late 17, early 18. And it wasn't until I started really digging into the mining side of things that I started to understand why Bitcoin was fundamentally different than everything else through proof of work mm. and all these other mechanisms. And so it's very curious that you you were sort of still in the, your altcoin phase, but then you, you latched on to mining as something that felt maybe like real and tangible, perhaps. Yeah, that's a very interesting comment. And, and actually, we were GPU mining, so we weren't ASIC mining. So we were GPU mining. And if you remember, Ethereum was still proof of work yep. back then. So we were actually mining Ethereum. It was, it was gotcha. the most profitable uh, to be mining. Um, but, but to your point, I, di I didn't understand Bitcoin when I started the company. I ended up becoming the CEO of a crypto company at about the same time that I became a Bitcoin maxi. <laughs> so I'm sitting there with just completely misaligned value prospect in terms of what we were building. And I remember the exchange guys going, hey, Rich, you know, we want you to join the listing committee um, because we want to add XRP to the exchange. I was like, no, never, shitcoin. And by the <laughs> way, we have to delist everything else and we should be predominantly focused on Bitcoin and just doing Bitcoin derivatives. And so, yeah, it, it became a bit of a problem with, the, with running the company. At OnRamp, 
We believe that Bitcoin is the most important asset of the 21st century. The hard part is securing it right. There are shortcomings with keeping your coins on an exchange, but also with setting up your own self-custody arrangement. OnRamp solves for these concerns. Our multi-institution custody solution maximizes security and minimizes counterparty risk, ensuring that your Bitcoin remains securely in your possession and provides built-in inheritance planning to ensure your family is protected as well. OnRamp provides peace of mind for your Bitcoin journey, whether for your whole stack or for part of it as a complement to your existing self-custody setup. For more information, check us out at onrampbitcoin.com. What was it ultimately, Rich, that led you to the more Bitcoin purist or maximalist position? I don't know if uh, you touched on that in the story, but to Brian's point, it's like you, ha- you uh, had your 5X on Litecoin. You had, uh, I th- believe it was Herman <laughs> on the desk, didn't buy you the Bitcoin. <laughs> And then you (laughs) transitioned into the mining space. You were doing um, some mining. You mentioned of Ethereum and some other coins. Where Mm -hmm. in that story did you really go down the rabbit hole on Bitcoin and start to fundamentally understand the difference there? You're going to laugh, but for a long time, I didn't know that Bitcoin was limited to 21 million. And when I understood that, I was like, okay, normal question was, well, how can we be sure that it's not going to be more than 21 million. How, do, how can we be sure that that won't get increased? And as I mentioned, in 2012, I'd become mentally, I'd become a hard money guy. Uh, I'd started buying gold. I was just like, this is the only way we can escape this fiat disaster um, that is impending, for sure. And uh, yeah, when I understood that Bitcoin was 21 million, I think I started listening to a lot of Bitcoin focused podcasts. And I listened to the Pomp podcast with Murad, um, where he was talking about Bitcoin. And it was October 2018. And I remember I listened to it just before going to bed. And I woke up that morning and I was like, I need to buy Bitcoin. I need to buy a lot of Bitcoin. And so I went out, bought it at 6,000. And then it immediately halved to 3,000. (laughs) And uh, when... (laughs) Then I, uh, I was like, okay, no, this is an opportunity and just kept going. So it was good. That, uh, but yeah, that, that was my moment. Yeah. It, I've never heard anybody else recently bring it up for years because that's an old school pod. That single-handedly might be the best podcast that's ever been done about Bitcoin in 60 to 75 minutes. Yeah. It's absolutely fantastic. It was fantastic. very strong. And it's very yeah. prescient. Like everything has like literally happened to a T that was described uh, mm. in that podcast from like the market structure forming to the adoption cycles. Uh, and the unit bias is a funny thing that you reference because I think that's most people in 17, you get in and then you just buy all this other crap. Uh, and similar yep. to you, you look at it and you're like, well, this all can't be valuable. Like what, what's actually happening here? And you quickly find out, okay, th- there's some value here, but it's not everything. Exactly. I think the unit bias was another thing that progressed me further down the road. It's like when you get to the point of thinking of everything in Bitcoin, like, you know, when you're in banking, you're kind of a slave to this ridiculous salary that you've got. You can never leave. You're locked up in stock, right? As a managing director in a bank, you've got a shit ton of stock. If you leave, you lose the stock, right? You have to get fired. Uh, to be able to hold on to your stock, which is a fairly ridiculous incentive structure. <laughs> um, but but that that's how it is. And so you're, you're kind of a slave to this system. And um, when you, you know, I mean, I remember when I was back in 2015, I would have a spreadsheet with my US dollar value of everything. And you sort of, you've got your investments and you're working out, you'd open your spreadsheet every day. You're like, how am I doing today? But when that denomination moves from dollars to Bitcoin, everything changes. Everything just gets much more simple. And, um, you know, we, we do an annual summit here for investors in, in Zurich. And uh, I had Jeff Booth uh, at the summit uh, this year. And uh, I was sat with Jeff at a table while we, we had a panel on uh, asset allocation. So, you know, you had this group of experts, titans of the traditional financial industry going, you know, I think this year, you know, private equity, we probably want to see another 5% allocation and probably, you know, be dropping private credit a little bit because that's become a little bit overheated. 
And we sat there and we're like, you know, it's just so easy, so simple just to be a Bitcoiner, you know. It just makes life so much easier. You're not messing around with it, just most of this nonsense. And it is nonsense, right? Because it's all dollar denominated at the end of the day. So, you know, you're just like scrambling up the hill trying to beat that debasement rate. And, yeah, Rich, yeah. I, it's a great point. I, I have a question on that just because you were brought in, I think you said in 2022 to lead the hedge fund business at Seas. So are you still mm -hmm. doing that type of work at the company? And then how do you, how do you balance uh, your investment philosophy or savings philosophy personally focused predominantly on Bitcoin with uh, having to also be able to speak the language and be knowledgeable about all these alternative investment strategies? Like how, how do you manage that personally? Well, look, I mean, I, I traded against hedge funds and sold to hedge funds for my entire financial career. So I know the product very, very well, so I can speak about it. And like, you know, being a Bitcoiner, as you all are, I'm sure you've had the same experience. There are some people that are just not ready to go on the journey, right? And so, you know, when you're talking to a guy, he's a billionaire and he's looking to allocate capital and he's looking to put 10% of his money into hedge funds, you know, you, you can say, look, maybe you could think about some of the alpha prospects that are available in this different asset class and start to move him down the track towards that. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, ha I had a meeting this morning with a guy who's, who's starting off with 20 million allocated to hedge funds. And he was like, don't ever talk to me about crypto. I don't want to hear it. Super smart guy, double PhD, like, but it's just not going to happen. So, you know, you have to understand that some people are ready and some people are not. And, you know, I think, this is this is what I'm trying to do here. You know, when I do the summit, the investor summit every year, I have a, a Bitcoiner come and speak at the summit. Well, this year, obviously, we had Jeff Booth. Last year, we had Dan Tapiero and uh, Scaramucci, which was fun. And then we had Willy Woo uh, the year before that. So just gentle education of these more traditional mindset investors, because you, you can't just, you know, throw everything at them all at once. I mean, it's a, it's a big journey. I mean, we've all been on a journey. You, you guys mentioned 2018. I'm sort of a 2018 vintage Bitcoiner as well. It's, it's taken a long time to get to this point, right? So yeah, you, you can't it, expect these guys to get there all at once. It's incredibly exciting to have someone like yourself with your background involved because it's, it's like a cheat code when you have professional experience in a different domain and you come in because you can understand the, the frame of reference so you don't hit them mm -hmm. over the head with the hammer because historically in Bitcoin's first call it 10 to 15 years, it's to have fun staying poor. It's just pushing people actually away from the asset, even though we just mm -hmm. historically didn't recognize it as such. And uh, we see this in the West um, specifically or like with the registered investment advisor groups. You can have the resident Bitcoiner, the resident you know, even rationalist that understands this mm -hmm. stuff and is all in. But then it's very hard for them to put their investment uh, advice or, or gives any kind of uh, acknowledgement of like, hey, maybe you want one, two, three percent because of this historical stigma that comes with crypto or Bitcoin. Mm. And so it's a very you have to be very convicted to be able to like even start to have that conversation, which requires tact and, and discretion that I think um, is required from somebody that understands that cohort. You can't come from outside and you're like, you need Bitcoin because you don't know what their pain points are and what their like incentive models mm. are. Um, so it's a really exciting next, I think, decade we're going to see because this 18 to 23 vintage is really brought in professionals that I don't think historically were in the space. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And Michael, to I'd that say, point. I'd say it's spot on. Yeah, I was going to say. Sorry. Um, all good, Rich. Um, to Michael's point as well, it's it's interesting because there's a you have to be able to effectively communicate to people and speak their language, right? So one of the challenges as it relates to Bitcoin in an asset allocation framework is that Bitcoin, you can make the case that Bitcoin is its own asset class. But if you go back to folks who are allocated to public equities and private equity, you know, real assets, venture, whatever it may be, you, you get stuck in this conversation where you're trying to fit this new asset class of Bitcoin into an existing bucket. And we've done some work mm -hmm. around that, right? And trying to figure out, and it, it'll depend on the investor and their framework and how they're approaching it. They may say Bitcoin is more akin to a real asset because they see value or properties that 
exist within gold, right, um, in terms of scarcity. But you could also make the case that Bitcoin has like more of a venture feeling, not in the same way that we'd say that, uh, you know, cryptocurrency is venture capital, but in the sense that Bitcoin as a protocol is following um, an exponential adoption rate, which we do see with other tech plays, right? So I'm curious, Rich, like when you you mentioned earlier communicating the alpha prospects of Bitcoin to some of these traditional allocators, do you typically try to fit Bitcoin into one of these buckets to speak their language, or do you really just make the case that Bitcoin is a standalone asset class, and does that resonate with the folks that you're speaking with? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's something that I've sort of changed tack on a little bit recently, and I think the the problem is all of us are capable of sitting down at a dinner and convincing someone they need to buy Bitcoin. You know, you can talk about price, you can talk about exponentiality, you can talk about adoption of the internet, you can talk about digital gold, all of these things. But the problem is that it always comes down to the same problem. And I had this exact example with a friend of mine recently. We sat down to dinner, he just sold his business and he'd, you know, he'd made several million and he was like, Hey Rich, you know we hadn't seen him for a few. I hadn't seen him for a few years, and he was like, "Hey Rich, should I, should I put all my money in Bitcoin?" You know, is as a joke, is a goofball joke. And I was like, "Okay, yeah, but by the end of the dinner, by the way, you're going to say, <laughs> yeah, I want to put all my money in Bitcoin," and he did. And at the end of the dinner, he was like, "Okay, so yeah, no, I need to. Like, what should I do?" And I was like, "Look, first of all, you can't put all your money in Bitcoin because if you do, when it goes down fifty percent." your wife is going to call me and she's going to go, Rich, you're an asshole, right? Um, And what it needs for you is to go on this journey. You need to understand why I'm so convicted, so convicted that you are now completely convicted, even though when you go and buy it and see it drop 50%, you're going, what the fuck was I doing listening to Rich? Sorry, excuse my language. But... um, yeah, I mean, this is this is the problem. If you get people excited about the potential for price appreciation, because we do all know where it's going, and we can all be very convincing about that, then they're going to buy it and they're going to sell it at the wrong time. So what I try to do now, and this this also works well with that very I know everything kind of person. Um, which are much harder to orange pill. You know, these are the guys, you can't tell them anything. They know everything about everything, right? Of course, Bitcoin is just some idiot project that you're involved with. Um, So with them, this also works well. So the way that I present it is, look, you spend your whole life working for, you know, that moment where you're able to walk away and go, I'm free. Um, I've made enough money uh, and, and I can retire and I can go and live on the island or do whatever it is that I want to do. So you have a vote right here, right now. You have a single vote and you can make that decision, right? You can vote to store the time and energy of your labor in a system that can constantly be debased without your control by the control of a bunch of old guys sitting in a room deciding you know, what they're going to do with monetary policy. And debasement rate is normally around somewhere between 10 and 15% in recent years. Or you can put your time and and energy into a system where that cannot be debased, that is purely algorithmic, is controlled by no one, and is 100% finite. And you know what everybody says when you say this to them? Yeah, of course, but. And you're like, of course, but what? Like that is the vote that you have right here, right now. But the challenge is understanding what I've told you about that second system. It's understanding that everything I've just told you is true about that second system. Because the answer is, of course, if you just understand that what I've told you is correct, then the answer is, of course. And that's been very effective with people lately. Yeah, I I really like that that framing. I guess one <clears throat> one thought on that, and, and I'm sure you've experienced this as well. I started my career in traditional finance space, and and like you were saying, like there's a lot of those people who um, are very very smart, intelligent folks in their own right. Um, but I think that leads them down this path of hubris to the extent where 
even if you make that argument that you just laid out, they mm -hmm. won't believe that second system because in their minds, well, one, they just haven't done enough research as you. So it seems too good to be true, right? Like on paper, if this second system existed to your point, obviously you would store your time and energy in that system. But there's that hurdle of really, I think it's just like ego and hubris for a lot of these folks. And, and at this point of the, the, the sort of trajectory of this thing, we're 15 years in, those folks have seen multiple cycles, right? Like they heard, they must have heard about Bitcoin within the past five to 10 years, at least once or twice, right? So they've seen these cycles play out and now they have an inherent bias because they didn't act on it prior, right? They, they didn't do the more, they didn't do incremental research last cycle or the cycle before. So now when someone tells them like, Hey, maybe you should consider this. It does take a massive amount of, you know, uh, killing their own ego to some extent and admitting maybe they were wrong in the past. And I think that's particularly hard for a lot of folks in the traditional finance space because they have made, you know, very successful careers in their own right and, and done amazing things. So it's, it, it's particularly hard for those folks. And then the other, the other piece which you mentioned earlier, which I like, and I think, you know, maybe as Bitcoiners, we just need to do a better job of, of doing like public service announcements that there are only 21 million, because that's, that's something I hear a lot too, is if, if you haven't done any work and you've only heard of Bitcoin, there's a good chance mm -hmm. you actually don't know that there's only 21 million. And then the other component is also the unit bias. It's like those two things. If we could just try to eliminate those, that would get past a lot of hurdles mm -hmm. for folks. Yeah. The unit bias is a problem. People will always say, well, I was, I was in uh, a, a very senior guy who runs a asset management company, billions and billions of dollars. And he was like, so how much is one Bitcoin? And we got to the point in the conversation, he was like, okay, I'm thinking about buying, you know, one for each of my kids. How much is one Bitcoin? I'm like, at the time it was $70,000. He's like, $70,000? He's like, I'm way too late. I've missed <laughs> yeah. it, right? And, and that's the problem. Yeah, it's the unit well, bias. And so that's what's fascinating. I think we're at an inflection point um, because Jackson brought it up. And this comes across, I think, anyone that's having conversations with a traditional financial crowd or traditional finance crowd of where does it sit? What bucket? How do I think about it? And I think a component of all of this is uh, in any cell is you're competing with the status quo. So what are people used to doing and how do you get them to move? And if you're looking at Bitcoin, you're like, maybe there's some room to go or run, but it's like at best one, two, three percent. It's it's magic internet money. So why do I care? Like I'm willing to miss out. But yesterday with mm -hmm. what BlackRock and Larry Fink came out with that, it's like, I don't know the exact quote, but it's referencing mortgage, um, the mortgage market and anywhere between 10 to 50 trillion, whatever the the like cap. He's saying it's a standalone asset. That's something we've started to coalesce around here at OnRamp when we talk with whether it's um pensions or just in any institutional allocator and referencing let's segment Bitcoin from crypto and then let's segment that this is its own bucket as you would think about in a traditional like 60 40 this is its own asset class by itself because once you start looking at it like that it's like well how much room can it move and so once that narrative starts to grow coupled with I'm convinced that the six figure mark that 100k is really what gets like friends like yours that looked at it at 70k and it's like oh it's too gone too far gone because at 100k you're like wait where where, where does this train stop is it does it stop at 10 like a million 10 million but right now the psychological barrier is 70k maybe it goes to zero but at 100k it's like what would cause this to go back to zero and then now you start looking at on the in the other direction mm -hmm. yeah no, i definitely agree i think i think the problem for a lot of people is that unit bias i think that I wasn't exactly sure what Larry said. Did he basically say that it is going to take a chunk of the mortgage market? I think he said Bitcoin could grow to be as large as the U.S. housing market, if I'm not mistaken, which was about a fifty trillion dollar number. Yeah, I'll find I'll find it. And you know, he said this after because his bags are packed, and that's why we're sitting like at sixty seven, sixty eight thousand dollars because <laughs> exactly. he's like, all right, it's 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 go time. I'll find the tweet and I'll pull I'll pull it up. Yeah, no, I saw, I saw the headline pop up. I just don't recall. I, I didn't read it. Um, but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, BlackRock coming into the scene has been significant for a lot of our investors. You know, this, I remember, you know, going and meeting with investors and, you know, you get introduced as the Bitcoin guy and they're like, oh, yeah, Jamie Dimon says it's a scam or Christine Lagarde says it's a scam. And now 
when they see one of these folks, i.e. Larry Fink, saying, no, no, this, this is legit. This is an asset you need in your portfolio. This is now changing conversations quite significantly. So La Larry's arrival is, is very, very helpful uh, for the institutional orange building. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. Um, because this time last year, it, it was still uncertain uh, that if the U.S. ETFs would be approved. Um, I think we were kind of nearing certainty mm. just based on how that court decision went, I believe, in August. But it certainly has helped from our conversations with the traditional allocators thinking family offices, registered investment advisors, institutional allocators. When we were reaching out to those folks in summer of 2023, a lot of them were kind of like get lost, right? Because the Bitcoin price was $25,000. Uh, there was no, there was really no expectation that there would be ETFs approved in 2024. But now the conversation has changed materially. And one thing that we plug into a little bit is the 13F filings and just taking a look to see under the hood who actually owns these financial products. And there's, pen, you know, as we all know, there's pensions involved in the asset class. There's a lot of uh, registered investment advisors that, you know, they prioritize their fiduciary duties. So the 13F filings, right, it allows us to take a peek under the hood and see what type of investors own the Bitcoin ETFs. And we have pension funds that have shown up this year, right? Very large ones in the United States that are mm -hmm. only just dipping their toes in with a 10 basis point allocation, but that's you know, much larger than zero. I think in terms of nominal value, it's 160 or $180 million investment. Now there's a couple of pensions involved. And then there's the registered investment advisors that are fiduciaries for their clients. So they're either recognizing that there is a big value proposition in allocating the Bitcoin for their clients uh, as an uncorrelated asset, you know, an emerging asset class, or that means also that their clients are reaching out to them directly and asking for Bitcoin exposure. So I just wanted to touch on the point that you made that having the CEO of the world's largest asset manager being now an advocate for Bitcoin and having a product and having skin in the game, right? And having an incentive for Bitcoin to be adopted by his business and his clients is a huge tailwind that really hasn't, is only started to materialize. It's really just the first inning. I think a lot of people don't understand that yet. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, we, we talked about podcasts before. I think the work that you guys do with this podcast and just having more and more education out there. If you remember when we were talking about that Murad podcast, it was actually quite hard to get good quality Bitcoin content back then. And I think what's interesting is now there's just so much, um, you know, even we at Seize Capital, we launched a podcast recently, obviously not a Bitcoin podcast. But what we do is we focus on a particular issue in the world, be it climate change, food security, energy security, something like this. And then we'll dig into the problem. We'll talk about a solution. And more often than not, the investment proposition by the expert that we've brought in ends up being Bitcoin, as amongst other things. So it's quite funny that we've got this podcast we're trying to address real problems. Obviously, we've designed it for institutional investors and alternative investors. And the conclusion often at the end is, well, probably need a bit of Bitcoin. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I mean, all roads do lead to Bitcoin one way or another. I'd be curious on that vein in particular, Rich, I know. So I had come across your podcast this week, just taking a look and seeing what you've been up to in preparations for this. And um, was it Eric C's that was on the podcast recently? Uh, I caught yeah. a bit of that episode and that was interesting to hear um, just his entrepreneurial background and um, you know all the, the work that they've done over the decades uh, with C's Capital. One thing that you mentioned that's really interesting to me and if you could share it, that'd be, that'd be fascinating. Just like the investment case for Bitcoin in the fiscal uh, perspective and well, the f fiscal perspective and then also just the asymmetric opportunity that exists within Bitcoin due to its properties um, are, are pretty easy to explain or for someone to understand if they are willing to do the work and pay attention. But maybe um, in terms of geopolitics or energy, like some of the conversations you've had early on in the podcast, how have you found those lead into Bitcoin or, or 
how did these people come in with their background and maybe not see Bitcoin before? And now after having a conversation, they're uh, willing to open up their eyes and see a new perspective of how this could be uh, a technology that could help to solve a problem there. Yeah, I think the energy security one is is probably the most interesting. I always talk talk about the fact that El Salvador's volcano bond, when it eventually launches, will be a complete game changer for broad energy security for energy rich nations or resource rich nations. Um, because if you think about a country like, say, Argentina, so Argentina is extremely rich in energy resources. Uh, in resources in general, but also has huge amounts of hydro in the north, um, huge solar panel farms up in the north as well, um, with the propensity to grow massively. And they're still taking, you know, loans from the IMF, right? So if you could imagine a way that you can monetize all of that clean energy and start to use that for the benefit of the nation, and then even do a sailor and raise even more money on the back of expansion of that infrastructure, making you even more energy secure. You actually move to a point of actually being, you know, having the IMF's involvement being completely redundant. And so freeing these com countries that have been really held in poverty for a very long time due to not being able to have, you know, a monetization of their resources that they have in, in their country. Like you look at much of Central Africa, it's the same situation. You know, really heavily um, reliant on IMF loans to stay afloat, but you know, very resource rich countries. So this is, this is the, the, the gap uh, that we discussed actually in the first episode with, uh, with a brilliant guy, uh, a guy called David Legg, who we had uh, on the podcast. Not, he is a Bitcoiner now as well. Um, so he was at the summit with Jeff Booth. Um, so, yeah, we've um, we, we got him over the line as well. But, uh, yeah, I think a lot of these experts come at the space, come at their particular problem. And look, we, we all know we all know that meme, fix the money, fix the world. Right. And uh, it's actually really true when you when you have a lot of these issues, Bitcoin does have a propensity to be able to change it. And one of the people that I want to get on the podcast to talk about environmental problems and, you know, climate change. I have young kids and, you know, they they're very worried about the environment. And uh, that's something that is being focused on in their schools. And we see it more and more. You know, if you think about Bitcoin as a methane capture tool um, for gas flaring or uh, landfill sites, um, this is actually a very, very interest, interesting way to monetize uh, Bitcoin mining with stranded energy. So again, you actually reduce the amount of methane going into the environment because it's just it's cheaper and quicker for the landfill to burn it all off as opposed to potentially combust it in a way that will, will create energy because no one's going to take that energy. But now you've got Bitcoin miners that can turn up and, uh, and reduce that that climate change impact. So, yeah, lots of different avenues uh, to that point, Jackson, uh, yeah. where Bitcoin can fix the issue. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly bullish for humanity and productivity because um, I don't know what is the most energy dense or oil rich. I think it's at least top three is Venezuela and Latin America. But the problem is that they don't have any currency uh, or the currency continuing to be debased. They can't coordinate economic activity. And that's a very like extreme example to get the energy out of the earth. Mm -hmm. But that's that's an extreme example. We experience this here anywhere, right? Where if you don't have a good form of capital, you can't plan for the future. You can't, if it's continuing to be debased, you cannot take a loan out plan. You see, you know, and again, micro example, a restaurant goes out of business because their inputs are constantly changing. And so they don't change them fast enough on the output, on the price for the, the customer and they get off sides. But what you just described bypasses that because ultimately you can source capital, Bitcoin from anywhere in the world. You can structure a product. You can hold the capital in, in a unit that's not being debased. You can coordinate that capital to go and pull the energy out of the earth, mine the BTC and then mm -hmm. get it out. And that's just like the, again, extreme example, but that plays anywhere and you don't even need any, you know, you can figure out your legal construct, obviously in different regions, it's going to matter, 
But um, even setting the mining to set up a wallet, we see this a lot in Texas where a lot of our teams based that Texas and Middle East are primed to get Bitcoin because they understand commodity uh, commodities. And a lot of these investors maybe don't really want Bitcoin per se to hold, but they want to mine it at a, at a price less than the spot price and then auto convert into fiat. Mm-hmm. And they set up their own wallets in these like L- limited partner structures. So they'll mine to it. So you can imagine you can start to set up some of those structures in any market to invest and bring resources that historically would not have been able to because you didn't have the financial structure in place. It's, it's incredibly exciting. It is. We're in a completely new paradigm. And I, I really do think that volcano bond is the catalyst to really start to change things with these IMF indebted countries. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Maybe you still have coins sitting on an exchange worried about hackers. Or maybe you've set up your own self-custody but don't feel safe with your Bitcoin savings stashed on a little plastic device in your desk drawer. Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and our multi-institution custody solution. Here's how it works. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-sig vault just for you. Three separate institutions each hold a key. OnRamp, BitGo, and CoinCover. But none can move funds unilaterally. Instead, only you have control over your coins. With OnRamp's multi-institution custody, you'll sleep better at night knowing your Bitcoin is stored with best-in-class security on-chain with fault-tolerant multi-sig. If you believe your Bitcoin is going to be worth a lot someday, don't jeopardize that future by exposing your coins to hackers on exchanges, $5 wrench attacks in the real world, or perhaps most importantly, the risk that you might screw something up with a highly technical self-custody setup. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure reduces your personal attack surface and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to confidently secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Bitcoin is a -a once-in-a-species asset. Secure it right. Learn more at onrampbitcoin.com. Yeah, because you don't have to touch the, the traditional banking rails, which is important. I'm not sure if you're familiar. So Brian and I are partners at, a, I believe it's the first Bitcoin denominated venture fund. So we invest uh, across, you know, we're agnostic. So we invest in the Bitcoin ecosystem because we've been very close to it. Mm. And we, we kind of are building. So we spot a lot of gaps that need to exist in the market structure, which is why I'm interested in talking about Switzerland because we've been looking at, uh, you know, different companies looking to get set up there. But we're ultimately agnostic. We're looking at anything that's looking at the world through a lens of, well, can I produce more Bitcoin by delivering value to the world and then sweeping it into BTC? But when we invest from our LPs invest in Bitcoin, we invest in the companies in BTC. And then the companies, this is the kicker, they value the underlying unit more than the dollar. So they hold their treasure or at least a portion in BTC, which extends their run weight and gives them an unfair advantage because they're more discerning with how they allocate capital. And you never have to touch the banking rails in a situation like that. You can because some people want to allocate dollars or some people need to Mm -hmm. accept dollars. But something like that had never been able to be done before. Um, And so when you don't have to touch the traditional financial rails, all sorts of different manifestations can come in that are effectively more productive if you ever had to send a wire or anything that has to deal with, you know, Swiss rail, Swift rails. That's fascinating. See, do you charge a performance fee on the returns over the Bitcoin allocated? Yeah. So hurdles are all, everything's denominated in BTC. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. We should chat offline about that. Definitely ha- happy to. I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll probably have some people that would be very interested to, to look at this. And, and we honestly think yeah. this is uh, just the future as well. We were the first, but ultimately when you go back, everybody kind of knows this, but the past hundred years have effectively been an anomaly, right? On this fiat standard. If you go back, Mm-hmm. You think about even allocation and capital. I like to joke and say um, it never would have been like Henry Ford is a great example that built all of his wealth with his bare hands, give all of that money to somebody that's never built anything or allocated. It, it doesn't make any sense. Somebody that was investment banking or you yeah. know academic to say, here's money, go find net new builders to build it, because mm-hmm. you've never built anything. So how would you know how to back test any of the process? But that's effectively what exists in venture today. And that's where we see a lot of capital just burned or lit on fire. And so the angle is you take existing builders, but then with the lens of the alignment of a unit that can't be debased and is not, you're not trying to play hot potato because right. an LP wants to get rid of the dollars because they're 
on fire all day long. So they need to go and find yeah. any allocator to put the capital to. And then the allocator needs to get rid of the dollars because they want to get more management fees. They want to raise a larger fund. Like people try to raise hundreds of millions of dollars in Bitcoin. It's like, you don't need a hundred million dollars. There's nothing, there's not that many companies invested. Don't make that kind of money. So you try to raise a capital, but then every, you have a hammer, everything needs to look like a nail. So then you're out there just looking mm -hmm. at companies. And this is where you see these companies get bit up without naming names. And now they're like crazy valuations that can't produce yeah. the returns. And then those people get told by the allocators, Hey, run, go hire as many people, go scale as possible. But it's just like that, that doesn't make any sense. Bitcoin's cyclical. So you literally mm -hmm. go hire, expend all that energy, destroy all that Bitcoin. Well, what if you just change that whole dynamic? Now the LP is more discerning with the BTC, the GP is more mm -hmm. discerning with the BTC. And the most important part is the actual entrepreneur, the allocator is the most discerning with the underlying. It's not to say you don't spend the Bitcoin, you just don't misuse it. And you, you look at the opportunity costs on AdWords hires through that lens of is Bitcoin's growth. Will this outpace Bitcoin's growth by the, the derivative returns? I think this is very interesting when you think about value alignment as well, when you factor value alignment into this, obviously when you're doing venture, you're backing a founder, right? And I think what's very interesting for you is you're backing founders that are Bitcoiners, like they have that mentality, or at least you know where their mentality is going, right? <laughs> because Bitcoiners tend to end up in the same place. You've got a long-term mindset, low time preference, as you say, you're very careful where you're going to allocate that Bitcoin because it's so precious, right? It's not, it's not those dollars. Okay, fine. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's run around, try and create some frenzy. No, when it's Bitcoin, you're allocating extremely carefully. And that's, that's insanely perceptive because it's something Brian and I talk about where individuals in the Bitcoin venture space will talk about well, you allocate, it's kind of like leverage on top of Bitcoin. And I look at that as a negative, not as a positive, because outside of a mm -hmm. few things like buying and custody Bitcoin, there's not really a lot of venture type returns. But uh, so you're basically layering in risk on risk because like Lightning's a great example. Mm -hmm. so we've never really found a use case. So you're layering on how do I like potentially find a use case? So you get the risk of uh, venture, plus you get the risk of the volatility of Bitcoin. Because if you invest in venture, that's already risky, but then you invest in the perceived or the potential use case for a new form of Bitcoin's uh, use, which generally outside of buying and holding from a venture perspective, it's not, it's very hard to justify a return. Mm. But what Brian and I talk about, uh, and this is the firm's called early writers in us being agnostic to, it's not dedicated to just solely Bitcoin infrastructure is to your point is that as individuals like yourself that come from backgrounds of 10 plus years, professional experience. They're going to look at their existing firms and look at it through the lens of understanding Bitcoin deeply. And they're going to say, this is full of fat and bloat and inefficiencies, especially with deflationary <laughs> tools. And now I can go and outcompete them because I know all of where all the gaps are, use a better form of mm -hmm. money. Uh, so you get the benefit of underlying better form of capital from an entrepreneurial perspective. And then you get the upside of them looking at the world through the lens of understanding Bitcoin, but not the risk of, oh, I'm going to go find the next way to scale Bitcoin, the next third layer and all the things associated. So it's interesting you picked up on that because that's where we're really excited. The, the number of entrepreneurs or LPs that we have in the fund are just like world class because when you have high signal, the right people find you because it's like, oh, this is what's been missing. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it almost might be the ultimate hack for venture capital. You know, it's Bitcoin only companies allocating it in Bitcoin. And you're, you're right, because this is the ultimate hack to actually getting back to efficient use of money. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just like, I it's really just like money, it. money doesn't grow on trees and we forgot about it. And so it, it might put now everybody thinks money grows on trees. Everybody wants the next round, you know, all the stories. But the reality is Bitcoin doesn't grow on trees. And Bitcoin has opportunity and Bitcoin has, you know, there's a cost of capital, it's Bitcoin. And as everyone starts looking at the world through that, you literally get to the most efficient use of that capital. And the kicker is, mm -hmm. I like to joke, it's like on a scale of one to 10, whether it's listed companies or unlisted companies, there's a certain amount of fat that exists because we've been on this fiat standard. So the goal is to, as Bitcoin, you start to look, you start to look in the most. And those people will outcompete all the other people over a long enough time horizon because it's just the most efficient use of that money, even if it takes longer. And this is what Henry Ford figured out very early on when there would be deflationary periods, he would sell everything 
even though he had to take it at a mm. loss. And then he'd close down the factory, get more efficient and come back and outrun everyone because that's what you're supposed to do when misallocation of capital happens, not continue to paper over. And we just somehow all mm. forgot about this. Mm. You, you really yeah, picked up on it. Some of the history on that. Yeah, you, you picked up on one of the core things to me it, is just the sort of realignment of incentives in private investment, venture, whatever it is. I think those incentives got very distorted over the past 50 to 100 years as we had basically, uh, you know, free money that could be printed infinitely that distorts all the incentives down the line from LPs to GPs to founders. And we're just sort of going back to a time when, when those incentives were more aligned. And the other really fascinating thing about this for particularly the entrepreneur and the founder is you, you might only need to raise capital once, maybe twice, but it, mm -hmm. you might just be able to do it once and extend your runway as, as your Bitcoin treasury grows. Uh, and then you can avoid, you know, further dilution into the future. So it's, it's, again, it's fully just aligning the, the incentives between all the different parties involved and, and really just rethinking how capital should be allocated within a Bitcoin lens. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I like it. I think, uh, for, for me, it, it really comes back to the values as well. Because you want to make sure you're investing in a founder that is honest. And I don't know why, but it just, Bitcoin leads you <laughs> to more of a honest, purest way of thinking, right? Bitcoin is truth. It leads you to truth. You want to represent that same truth in you, right? So when you're backing a founder, you need a founder that you can trust, obviously, that t you can trust him to make the right decisions. And that, that truth aspect, that long-term mindset, all of these things come together uh, for Bitcoin and the value system that it creates. So uh, I'll say it again. I think you guys have found an interesting it, hack here. It, it's impressive how fast you picked up on it because I don't know how quick like uh, us sharing because it's obviously a little bit novel, but you, you hit the nail on the head. There's nothing more scarce than the human capital, like scarcer than Bitcoin. And uh, that's the component, the way to execute on this. And the, the, the beautiful part about Bitcoin is when you meet somebody, you know, right off the bat, I like to joke. And it's like, we all agree that on, we agree on 90% of things. We don't want people taking our money. The last 10% is on the margins on like, you know, you know, what's happening here in local politics. And once you cut through all that noise, you just immediately know like where somebody stands and then you can start to build on the merits of like, you know, the professional experience and things like that. So it really is an interesting kind of cheat code to, to find the right operators from a founder perspective or just like folks that have joined our firm, you kind of know right off the bat where they, where they sit. Yeah. yeah and I was in, I was in Amsterdam with the boys at Relay and they had a lot of the team there and it's just, it's, it's so good to see them so enthusiastic and so driven and so excited about what they're doing because they're so behind passionately what they're building because they believe so much in the underlying uh, Bitcoin behind the whole system. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it just creates the best outcomes, I think, for, for venture investors. Yeah, Rich, maybe on, on that vein, I'd be curious to hear more about what you're seeing in Europe as it relates to Bitcoin only businesses, Bitcoin institutional mm -hmm. adoption, whatever, wherever you want to take it. But maybe a perspective that you have that we don't necessarily have being based in the States. Um, and you, again, whether you want to touch on specific um, companies or p specific countries within Europe that you're seeing more adoption, more favor favorable regulatory environment. Um, but really, I'd be curious to hear what you're seeing in your seat. Yeah, I mean, one thing that I found quite interesting in, in Switzerland is that you have this crypto valley in Zug, um, which has been around for a while. And there's some big, big Bitcoiners that live there and, and stay there. And um, what I found is, though, that not a lot of them are purist Bitcoin maxis. Um, because I think that because they've been in crypto, for, I was talking to someone about this the other day, because they've been in crypto for so long, they get the inside track on, you know, this new token that's going to list or whatever. And so they can make the 500x and then convert it back into Bitcoin. Um, and so 
in a funny kind of way, they're still shit coiners. Um, and so they're not quite of the Bitcoin mindset that you see much more in the international community. So I always go to the Bitcoin conference in the US. I just, as I said, got back from Bitcoin Amsterdam. You know, that mindset that you get at a Bitcoin conference and the people that you're likely to meet there, they're pure Bitcoiners, right? Whereas when you talk to someone at Crypto Valley in Zug, where even though these guys are massive holders of Bitcoin, they're still shitcoining around and mucking around in this nonsense, which is something that I, I find quite weird. Um, even if you say to a Bitcoiner, look, you can, uh, you can go and invest in this token and make a quick uh, 500%, they're not going to do it. They're pretty much not going to do it because they're like, well, yeah, but no thanks. I don't, I don't want to run the risk of losing my Bitcoin. And I'm very relaxed with my Bitcoin. When we talk about asset allocation, you just don't even need to bother with it. I know that I'm going to be making you know, significant multiples in a dollar-based system anyway, so I don't need to muck around. So I think that's quite an interesting thing that I've discovered here being in Switzerland. I would say in terms of Bitcoin only companies, they're quite rare. Um, obviously, Relay is, is one. I think Relay's competitors, I mean, Relay have done a very, very good job of marketing across Europe and, and being out there and being trusted. And, you know, they're just so passionate about what they do. Um, I think most of their competitors have disappeared or fallen away. Um, so those are Bitcoin company or, Bit, or they were Bitcoin focused companies that have have sort of uh, gone away just because they've been out competed by Relay. But yeah, it's it's not so um, so robust over here in terms of uh, Bitcoin only companies. What we are starting to see, and obviously again through my involvement with Relay is we're seeing more and more corporates, bit real estate companies through to just general, you know, carpentry companies, uh, putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet, um, slowly starting to understand that this can be a very interesting way to manage the treasury of the company. So this is something that is somehow um, getting out there. I don't know how it's getting out there. But people are, are discovering it more and more. And uh, yeah, so corporate adoption in the small and medium sized enterprises um, are, are getting, getting au fait with Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, Bitcoin only companies, is, they're still quite rare. Um, and as I say, the Swiss community is still a little bit shitcoiny. That mirror is pretty much very similar to the U.S. It's very hard to be Bitcoin only because um, unless you're going to, you know, sell fund and have been holding Bitcoin or like we said, reference finding on the, the Bitcoin allocator side, it's very hard to convince institutional capital to look at that because they're still looking at it as a diversification, you know, multiple asset uh, sector mm -hmm. versus how can you build a, a strong business, which to their credit, it's very hard to build a very profitable or any kind of profitable Bitcoin business because there's not a lot of things to do with it other than buying and holding. Mm -hmm. um, but curious, Rich, on the uh, the banking and lending side, because in the West, we're still or like in the U.S. specifically. We still haven't seen. Well, there's obviously a lot of the the uh, regulatory uh, hurdles that have been in place that are starting to get lifted. I think there's like two SEC exemptions, being one, one other, from a banking perspective that are letting them custody the asset. But it was shocking to me to find out that there's multiple Swiss banks that allow clients to they custody and then allow them to lend against the asset, which I think is just a natural part of the market structure for folks that don't want to sell. Uh, and want to do other things with the underlying curious like what's built into that and is that just part of swiss banking and being very forward thinking or is there any other kind of factors involved it's it's not i mean the the swiss banks um you know they've been watching uh their pie get reduced obviously by u.s regulation um in terms of how you deal with U.S. clients and just being very clamped down on the whole banking secrecy uh, side of things. That really impeded the the Swiss uh, banking um, advantage that they had for many years. Um, now they are having to push into being more innovative. And so that's why you've seen many of the Swiss banks adopt crypto. 
um, and be more broad. I think that what they're doing on lending on Bitcoin is impressive. Um, we still at Bank C's. Um, so we have as part of the overall group, we actually have a private bank as part of us as well. And um, we haven't got to the point of lending money against Bitcoin yet. Um, that requires obviously a system that is 24 seven. And so this is, you know, it's, it, it's quite far away from the way that the traditional banking uh, infrastructure works. You know, it's very hard to imagine um, bankers working on a Saturday or Sunday and dealing with margin calls and dealing with this type of thing. Um, and so I'm not actually sure how the banks that are doing it in Switzerland are actually doing it yet. It seems very early and very nascent. And I think they probably only do it with clients that have significant assets where they're not going to have a margin call and the LTV loan to value is very, very low. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not something we've, we've got comfortable yet in our banking division. Yeah, it's so, not for the faint faint of heart. Uh, maybe we can chat when we talk about early writers offline. My, my previous company, I think we're the only retail lender left standing in the 2022 space and it goes to your point the the loan to values have to be right and then it's a you're it's a 24 7 mm. game and you yeah. have to have really good relationships with your clients and, and really protect them mm. uh, from themselves and then the, the kicker is not rehypothecate where generally people get in oh, trouble yeah. is with the rehypothecation especially in traditional finance because they're not used to the volatility profile of bitcoin and so they think yeah. it's it's not risky to go get some some you know interest on that lending uh, in one or two hands removed, but then that happens. Rich, on the um, so your point about just Swiss banking having to be more innovative, uh, just given some of the U.S. regulatory environment changes over the years, I'm curious, like for banksies or or just for other private banks in Switzerland that are rolling out Bitcoin and crypto related services, is that more so demand driven are your private clients asking for these types of products directly with their existing banking relationships or is it more of a proactive and aggressive move by private banks to differentiate themselves among the banking sector in switzerland how how do you think about that and maybe what are some things that you're excited about within the bank, if you can share, or just about Swiss banking in general as it relates to Bitcoin related services and adoption? Yeah, I think it's a yeah, bit of both. Um, so when, when we get through the bull market cycle, which is probably going to happen next year, you're going to have a huge amount of clients wanting to get access to Bitcoin directly. But, you know, you're going to have a whole host of shit coins that they're going to want to trade and they're going to want to trade it in custody at their bank rather than at an exchange uh, that they probably don't trust as much. Um, so, you know, I think the conversation at Seas started in 2020, 2021, and the product was launched in 2022, where obviously there wasn't a lot of demand by then. I think it launched just a few weeks before FTX. Um, but then... Um, you know, now that's building again. Obviously, being a crypto bank, they've had onboarding of clients that have crypto holdings. Um, Seas is a very respected name in Switzerland. It's not very well known outside uh, in the US, but it is a very respected name. If you look at the other providers, they're predominantly crypto firms. So Seas is actually one of the very few actual real banks that existed prior to crypto. Um, that's actually offering crypto services. Um, but I would say, yeah, it's a little bit of both. There's a little bit of, um, you know, having to innovate, having to drive things forward, having to find ways to compete in the back of, you know, banking secrecy going away. But then there's also that little bit of the demand side coming through, through the bull market cycles. But also you've got a generational change happening in wealth as well. You know, you're starting to see the millennials, uh, the, the Gen Z's start to inherit uh, money. Switzerland's a really interesting place because it doesn't really have inheritance tax, which is why you still have some very wealthy families here. 
um, because they're not getting destroyed every generational change through inheritance taxation. Um, so, you know, that's obviously not the case for the US. It's not the case for the UK, where I'm from. So it's been quite another culture shock for me here is just how wealthy some of these families are. I mean, just like everybody's worth tens of millions, which is at least, you know. So, uh, yeah, there's some very wealthy uh, families and we're seeing that generational change now. So the Gen Zers, the millennials are starting to pick it up and they are paying attention to this space. Uh, they're interested in Bitcoin. They're interested in crypto. Unfortunately, they're interested in, you know, NFTs and other nonsense as well. Um, and, you know, every time I hear one of them sit down and say, Tell, talk to me about Web3, I'm like, oh, please, I can't. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's, uh, again, it's a bit like how do you sit in a meeting and talk about hedge funds with a guy? It's the same sort of thing. You've got to kind of come to an investor where they're ready and help guide them to to the right place. So, Rich, I was uh, I thought that was an interesting point that you made about there not being inheritance tax in Switzerland and just the idea of generational wealth there and, and that being more prevalent than in other countries. And that ties into something you mentioned as well, just as it relates to bank C's getting into Bitcoin and crypto related services and being a trusted name and a traditional finance firm, a banking partner that these families are already familiar with, whereas the other companies that are participating in the space are more crypto native and don't have the same brand recognition and level of trust that your firm's established. And we've seen that a lot too, uh, as it relates to our business and how we think about expansion plans. Uh, just one anecdote is that we have a sister company in the Middle East, uh, in, the, in the UAE, on Mina. And part of the idea there is that people want to work with businesses that are local to their region and that uh, that have trusted partners in the traditional finance space. So I just wanted to react to that because I think there is, we would all agree that Bitcoin has a ton of alignment as it relates to generational wealth. And there's obviously much more of a bias and interest in Bitcoin by millennials and Gen Z than there are in baby boomers. And then there's this massive transfer of wealth happening that's really just underway now and will happen over the next 15, 20 years where you have somewhere between like 70 or 80 trillion dollars of wealth um, that's being transferred from the baby boomers to these younger generations. And they all have a more of an inclination toward Bitcoin and digital assets. So I think that's a huge tailwind and it really positions well for uh, bank C's because you're ahead of the curve as it relates to being a really trusted name in banking and traditional finance and being early to the Bitcoin and crypto native services as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, we're excited about being positioned where we are. And I think C's Capital is obviously very well positioned to help advise some of these families in terms of the way that they want to they want to allocate. Um, the product that we currently have is a US dollar denominated product that provides a return in dollars. So I'm very interested about what you're saying, because we've had we've had some interesting demand from Bitcoin, cl Bitcoiner clients where they're like, look, love the fact that you can deliver a 15 to 20 percent return product, but it, in dollars. But I'm never going to send my bit, sell my Bitcoin for dollars to get a 15 to 20 percent return. So what can you do in Bitcoin? And so we're at the point where we're starting to say, OK, is there something to do here if we were to deliver a product denominated in Bitcoin, maybe a lower return than 15, 20%. Take the risk right down, as you said, Mike, you know, you want to make sure that you're super careful with the allocation of that Bitcoin, like you must not lose the Bitcoin, right? So maybe take the volatility of the fund down, be much more cautious with the strategies that you're allocating to. And then, you know, maybe you can get a five to 10% return uh, with a volatility around two and a sharper around two as well. You know, that then becomes a very interesting product for a Bitcoiner. Um, so, yeah, we're kind of we're going down uh, and seeing what we can offer uh, in terms of these types of products. But I think, you know, coming back to the comment that we just we were discussing earlier about, you know, what you guys have done in having a BTC denominated venture fund. I think that's something that, you know, we could have 
some sort of discussion about uh, as as a product that we would be not officially promoting, but you know, when people come to us and say they're looking at venture, I think that this is this could be a very interesting thing to be looking at. Yeah, and, and you guys are in a really interesting spot, maybe one of the best because I didn't recognize that Seas was historically a, a traditional bank and then adopted Bitcoin as a strategy because then it allows for all sorts of like esoteric cross collateralization products, which can help you get to those returns. Cause it's generally really hard just to get to a BTC return. If you're like lending it out for other people to trade it, because they're de- the problem with all that is they're denominating their return in dollars. And that's where people get off sides. But if you're able to structure yeah. products where BTCs uh, infused in a, in some kind of debt facility or whatever you would create for that return, because you have the clients and the assets, you can, you can do that. Awesome for a second. I missed the question, Mike. I'm sorry. The, it was no question. It was basically a recognition that you guys are in a unique pers- spot to do some kind of Bitcoin denominated return profile because you have other assets that you can incorporate into uh, a structured product. You're not you're not sitting at a like a hedge fund or a crypto tra- lending desk lending out Bitcoin to traders to swing it around yeah. to potentially give you back your two to five percent or whatever you're doing. You can structure it in traditional products that are less volatile have like, you know, claims on it from other uh, regulatory, you know, relationships that you know that this asset's sitting infused with these other assets when you make loans out or however you would, you know, source uh, the additional capital for investors parking that Bitcoin with you. What I would say is that one of the things that we're obviously doing with the dollar base fund is we're allocating to strategies where hedge funds can use it as collateral, right? So they're using the dollar as collateral, they're doing a basis trade or they're doing a volatility arbitrage trade. But now we switch that out and we say, okay, it's Bitcoin. Like your startup companies, we say, take the Bitcoin, make the return on the Bitcoin. And then that then is providing you, as I say, you know, maybe you're not going to make the same spread as you might make with the dollars, but we don't care if it's a, you know, three, five, eight percent return in Bitcoin, then I think, you know, and any Bitcoiner I know will be pretty happy with that as a return profile delivered to you by a Swiss banking group. And that's, that's the thing that's starting to um, be of interest. And I think that's why what you guys are doing is also of interest. Do you have any target IRR on the fund? That's a good, good question. Uh, Brian may be able to speak to it a little better on the, um, when I look at it, I look at it a little, I look at it from the opportunity cost of the Bitcoin that's being given up. And then where we look at from Mm -hmm. an equity perspective. Uh, so the percentage of Bitcoin, like we basically have a a higher hurdle rate when making allocation of looking at double digit equity percentages in businesses. And to Brian's point, Mm -hmm. because ultimately we look at a company raising once, if not maybe twice total. And so it's less from a total, like when you look at IRR from a um, mm. uh, acquisition perspective, most companies from venture are looking to get acquired. Uh, and a lot of this thesis was based on building on-ramp where we built with Bitcoin as its denomination because we were spending our own money to build the fund. And so the way we looked at it is from a downside, how do we protect? And the downside is from a Bitcoin positive business. So we can you know, pay our bills mm. and feed our family. And the upside starts to look like venture from equity value being delivered to the the enterprise value of the company. So you get the downside protection of a solid business and the upside of anything where it can go. But it's just it's incongruence with like how you would build in general, because you would you don't know. I like it like a baby. You don't know if it's going to be Michael Jordan or it's just going to play high school basketball. You can only foster (laughs) the environment in which it's been brought into the world. And same thing with an entrepreneur. And so to your point, the downside is protected by reoccurring revenue to return the BTC back to the investor. Uh, so the downside is protected by the reoccurring revenue to return back to the investor from the, or the allocation perspective. The upside is the equity value um, from an acquisition perspective. And then just depending on the type of firm, you might be able to buy hold that you're returning capital to LPs, investors, similar to like something how we think about honor and building this as a generational like private banking firm. And then the upside for certain investments would be like, well, it's bright for a bank. This is partially where we're looking at certain lending businesses because banks are just going to need to buy this because it's very right for acquisition versus uh, building because the custody is really fundamental to all lending that even though nobody talks about it, because you got to make sure the underlying is secure, transparent, 
or yeah. you basically get what you wake up one day and you're off sides. Um, and it's, I don't know if Jackson shared, if we, and maybe we can pull it up, but our models really like the, the cornerstone of all of this, because we feel that we have this, um, in, in Bitcoin's adoption, this inflection point where the market believed, um, the market effectively is believed, especially on the Bitcoin side, we're going to scale with self-custody. We're going to scale with plastic devices. And if you really think about yeah. it, it's just like literally impossible to, to, to do simply because at a certain point, people just start breaking in everybody's houses and like robbing their families. Like that's just what happens when you hold billions yeah, or hundreds of millions of dollars. But then the other alternative was you leave it all on Coinbase, which also can't happen. And so that's really, uh, yeah, big component of this is that nobody's really bringing solutions to the market of like, how do we actually create structured products uh, when somebody's holding, which we all probably on this podcast believe somebody's going to hold anywhere between 70 to 100% of their wealth in BTC. Well, that's not going to happen on a plastic device. Like people will never get there. You'll just hold to base dollars because at least they can't burn down or get hit with a hurricane. The other side of it is you're not going to leave it on Coinbase because we all know that's the, probably the worst thing you could ever do if you're holding your wealth in BTC. And so that's where this multi-institution model comes about. But then you can start to really, with the new design servers, create other structured products. So lending is a great example because now you have, it's basically governance built into the, the custody model, uh, which is, you can't do with gold, right? That's kind of where gold failed is you had to leave it with a central yeah. entity. Mike, I have a question for you. In terms of, this is a debate of, I had in Bitcoin Amsterdam, I was on a panel talking about both venture and hedge fund strategies in in crypto and Bitcoin. And the, the, the question came and uh, the way I answered it was, the question was, can you invest in a non profitable company and have them put Bitcoin on the balance sheet? So my question to you is, do you is your funds series A? I are you targeting cash flow positive businesses? Or are you still at very early stage seed for these businesses? In terms so of what you're doing, it's it's a great question. I don't think non profitable businesses should put Bitcoin on their balance sheet, uh, or Agreed. not to say non no, not to say non profitable. It's just it's it, it it's actually more of an art than a science because if you don't have any more bullets in the chamber, you can't do it. If you do have bullets in the chamber, then you can because you have to basically price the risk. And what I mean by that is mm -hmm. this is similar to like what. We weren't profitable when we started on ramp, but we put all of our treasury in Bitcoin because we had bullets in the chamber. We know people. We could raise capital. I hold Bitcoin. I could lend it to the business. Yes. So you yes. have to be able to have bullet. It's a, it's a, it's an art than a, it's more art than science. But then mm -hmm. to your other point, we're pre seed seed, but ultimately, like I would say, less of uh, around. We're we're at the end of the day value investors, and so we when everybody talks in venture about access, it's like. There's no such thing as access in Bitcoin. People will take your money if you go to them. Like if you put on Twitter, I'm starting a company, people like any Bitcoin, unless it's like some crazy fund that is just like completely unaligned, um, people will take fiat money. But where access really comes out is if you've built and you know how to build and people don't need your money, they need your expertise. And so one of our recent companies that's come in is already cash flow positive, generating about three to $4 million, doesn't need the capital they've been approached. But they've been hitting their head against engineering design and all the things that you need mm. to when you were trying to scale. And so they're literally giving us a double digit percentage of their business to incorporate all nice. the things. And so we're going to just start generating BTC right into the fund, right off the investment. And so that's that's mm. the idea there. And, and going back to going your, back to your you. earlier question, Rich, just on the sort of target. I would think of it more as like a multiple on invested capital of like 1.25x uh, in Bitcoin terms. Okay. That would be in Bitcoin terms. Nice. So that's, yeah. that's sort of what, you know, you were sort of um, alluding to around like, it's perfectly fine if the if the numbers themselves are smaller, if they're in Bitcoin terms, right? And so it's like, that's, that's sort of the mindset you have to get behind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'd agree completely. Well, Rich. Um, Very good. Want to be mindful of your time we're closing up here anything we didn't touch on that maybe you just wanted to share some quick thoughts on or if not where's the best place to direct people uh, that enjoyed the show today and want to either follow your work or your podcast or uh, get in touch with you i appreciate that jackson yeah the podcast is called seize the future syz all one word you can find it on Twitter. It's on obviously on YouTube and Spotify and all of that. 
Um, and then I'm at Richard Byworth on Twitter and I think on LinkedIn as well. Uh, LinkedIn is, I think I'm the only Richard Byworth in the world. Uh, so uh, you'll, you'll be able to find me. It's a bit of a rare name. Um, but yeah, if I'm not the only one in the world, I'm the one that's working at Seas Capital. So there you go. <laughs> awesome. Well, it was a pleasure, Rich. Really enjoyed getting to know you today and appreciate all the perspectives you shared. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, this was a great chat. Guys, thanks it was for a lot of Rich. fun. Yep. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the show. If you found the information valuable, please share the episode with a friend or leave a rating on your favorite podcast app. All the links we discussed in today's show will be in the show notes inside your podcast app. Before we finish, a quick reminder that OnRap Media is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and nothing should be construed as investment or legal advice. Regardless of where you are on your Bitcoin journey, we'd love to hear from you. Visit onrampbitcoin.com contact to schedule a consultation with one of our private client advisors.